I'll take you for a ride on the devil ship I'll take you for a ride where you sink or swim Now come with me and let this story begin Ted, welcome back Thanks for having me back. Are not, you not too many the... people have me back. <laughs> Usually once is enough. Because you keep telling <laughs> people to go fuck themselves. That guy back. You keep telling people to go fuck themselves. That's why. But I love that. That's my style. Uh, you tell them to go fuck themselves. Well, you, you paid me a very high compliment on Two Drink Minimum when Mike was talking about after listening to the first uh, episode of Standing By, the podcast that Terry DeMonte and I have done thanks to you guys and and. And you said, Mike said, how do you tell how do you tell the guy who runs every radio station in Montreal to go fuck himself? Yeah. <laughs> how do you do that? And you said, Well, Ted's like us, he's a rebel. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. It's easy. It's instinct. Yeah. You know what? Go fuck yourself. Well, you know what? It wasn't the smartest move ever, but uh, it sure felt good at the time. You, you know, uh, I got a lot of phone calls because of that interview with you two. Because people were so curious and they didn't know all the details. And they're like, hey, thanks for putting that out. I didn't know. And it was nice to see them in different light. And then the story kept coming up of you telling your boss to go fuck himself. They go, it's a shame, though. It's good they did it, but it's a shame that he burned those bridges. He should have been for years to come on mainstream media in Montreal. And it was that that probably blackballed him from uh, well, all yeah. kinds of And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a, a literal go fuck yourself. It was a, a metaphorical Go oh, but he accepted yourself. it just the same. Yeah, he, he took it that way, and you know what? That's the you know as I as I said on the on the podcast with uh, with you and Terry that time. That's the way it goes. I made my bed, and I have to sleep in it. How did you feel when you went? Because you were so used to those stations, the way it was, you know, Mix ninety six, and like the way Show is, it's all the same. How did you feel then, being like, you know what? Fuck it, I'm going to a smaller market, and I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need this anymore. Or was it more of a uh, well, fuck it. I, I can't live without the radio. I got to do radio. What, what was it that, what was that feeling? Well, it was first and foremost, I got to make a living. Like, you know, I have a family, I got kids and, uh, you know, I still have to make money. I'm not did you make smart investments when you were doing well? Or oh did God, you, no, 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 no. Yeah. It wasn't me that was frivolous, but, uh, there was some frivolity involved with the money. Uh, take it from me, kids, always be in charge of your own money. Don't trust someone else. Oh yeah with your money, or if you are entrusting someone else with your money, make sure that you're fully aware of what is going on. Because I just went, okay, you take care of that. And uh, boy, it was taken care of. All right. Anyway, I had to continue working. You got fleeced, Ted. Well, it, it's not that I got fleeced. It's just that, and, and, and it's, I don't want to get into it because it's a personal thing, but it's just that I did not keep a close enough eye on my own money. So again, that's my bed and uh, I made it and I have to sleep in it and, and, and whatever do yeah. I have everything to everything I need today. I have, I'll deal with tomorrow when it gets there. Yeah. So yeah, after I, after I left Shom, um, much Montreal English radio is, uh, it's not a big market and there are, as, as Mike pointed out, there are, you know, most of the stations are owned by one company. They're owned by Bell. Bell owns CJD, Shom, Virgin, which used to be Mix 96, and TSN 690. And then Kojiko owns the beat. So that's it for commercial radio in Montreal. You've got five stations and four are owned by the same company. So I had to figure out an alternative, and the alternative I figured out was K103 in Ganawage. And because I still had a high profile and my name was in the news for having left Shom, uh, they took a chance on me, and uh, they, they got some money out of the community. You probably know that that over in Ganawage, there are some pretty heavy hitters over there. There are some there are some guys over there with some pretty deep pockets. Oh, yeah. And the guy who was overseeing the radio station at the time got a couple of those guys to kick in some money. They said, we can get Ted Bird uh, to come over here and work on the... Um, work on the on the community radio station on K103 and maybe it would be good for the community. So these guys anteed up some money and it was good for me and it was good for them because I brought some attention and some focus to not only to K103 but to the community of Ganawage, which even though it's right across the river from Montreal, uh, it might as well be a foreign country yeah. because it's its own community uh, as a native reservation. It's its own unique culture and um you know, you want to talk about two solitudes, never mind English and French, Quebec and, and Ganawage. It's just, it's a different place. And people are, people have, have uh, huge misconceptions about Ganawage. And I had it as well. I would have been scared to go on the reserve before I went over there. Cause I don't know what I'm getting into. If I go on the reserve, are they going to be hostile to me? Right. Are they going to chase me out at the point of a gun? You think about what happened with Oka and, and, and the Ganawage Mohawks, uh, 
closed ranks with uh, the Mohawks in Oka, and they closed the bridge, and there were like machine gun posts set up in the whole nine yards. So, so it's you know it's it's it, it was unsettling, not unsettling, but it was. I went over there with trepidation because I wasn't sure what I was getting into, but I was completely embraced by the community, and I would like to think in part because you know I did and said the right things. And I did bring some positive attention to the community. And it was two of the greatest years of my life. I mean, I've told you the story before. I'll tell it again. It's one of my 10 stories. And my kids tell me, you got 10 stories, Dad. And you keep telling them on a loop. And one of the 10 stories is that you've got 10 stories. <laughs> so anyway, the story was about a year and a half into my run in Ganawage, I was going into uh, the coffee shop on the main drag there one day on Old Malone Road. And I passed a guy and his teenage son. I was coming out. They were going in. And they said hi, and I said hi, and the guy said to, to his son when I passed, that's Ted Bird. He's part of our community now. Yeah, that's huge. Like, how cool is that? Yeah. How cool is that to have a Mohawk from Ganawage say to his son, that guy, he's part of our community. That white West Island motherfucker right there, he's part of the Ganawage community. Meant the world to me. Oh, you wait. When Trudeau cancels me on the internet, I'm heading over to podcasting <laughs> Ganawage. It's done. They're getting a great guy. Great town, great people, great That's what playground is right playground poker yeah, is over playground. there yeah. uh the restaurant at playground poker the rail is one of the best restaurants in the Mont metropolitan montreal area there's some fantastic uh Mirella's, which is in what used to be snakes oh yeah, yeah. Uh, poker house i forget what it's called now but Mirella's is a great restaurant but playground is the best place to play poker here I, w I guess. I don't uh, know because I'm not a poker player. I haven't been in years, but it's. Uh, I loved it. As as Terry yeah. DeMonte once said when we went to a, when we went to a uh, we were on a radio station trip down to the Bahamas. We were in Nassau and we went to uh, we went to a casino and Terry went, walked over to the dark garbage can and just threw two hundred dollars in the garbage can and said, "Done. Look at the time I saved." <laughs> he didn't leave it there. He picked it out afterwards, but it was pretty funny. You don't have any what's up at Playground? Uh, the the dealer was a podcast fan. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. So he like he he was kind of like oh you know he was excited Fantellas you know and then I literally I think I lost one hundred eighty dollars in a minute <laughs> like that's the most <laughs> embarrassed. I was like all right I'm out like <laughs> this is a bad night but it was so embarrassing he's like excited he's like this guy's a terrible poker player <laughs> are you an experienced poker player like, I, do you back play then when I would play a lot now yeah. I haven't played in years I'm gonna get fleeced see I don't know yeah. shit about never mind poker I don't know shit about blackjack I've gone to the Montreal casino and sat at the five dollar blackjack table and you know I'll have you know, a face card and a three or a four. And I guess that, you know, the, the experienced players will tell you, oh, you got to stay with that. You can't, don't take another card, even if it's only 13 or 14. Don't take another card because you'll ruin the run, oh, yeah. right? You're going to ruin the run of cards. I take another card and I bust and the guy next to me is going, oh, fuck. Yeah, I hate you it when... You ruin the run. And I said, buddy, if you're such a big fucking deal card player, what are you doing at the $5 table? Yeah. Why don't you go over to there to the $50 table? With your shitty fucking uh, Mr. Big Shooter attitude. Also, part of the whole thing is you don't know what was going to hit. Next. Well, that's it, yeah. So, you know, if it was something that would have benefited you, you'd be like, yeah, thank you for doing that. So shut the fuck up. This, there's strategy and there's, and there's chance in both of those games. There's more strategy in poker, but it's mostly reading people. It's more, more yeah, that, that, because you know I, what you have. Yeah, that's what I understand. You see, and I would, <laughs> that's what would make me a shitty poker player. I'd be like, holy Jesus, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> or I'd be, oh, for fuck's sake. You yeah, know, so, one of the two. Something, but they catch on sometimes. It's interesting to watch the guys on TV with their sunglasses and their hats pulled down and everything. They, I, I don't know if you're allowed. I always wanted to have headphones on so I could listen to music, but I don't know if you're allowed. And I don't want to try. I don't want to get embarrassed at the poker table at the casino. Like, sir, take your headphones in case they think you're cheating. Because yeah. I always wanted to listen to music. But no one else on the table ever does it. So I don't want to be that one guy that gets embarrassed. You ever see Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, the Guy Ritchie movie? Yeah. They're playing poker, aren't they? They're Is playing that a poker, poker and, game? Yeah, and he's uh, he's cheating by yeah, there's tapping cameras, in. And there's yeah. cameras and stuff, too. They're it, doing Morse code. Yeah, that's a great movie. That's it's a great awesome movie. movie. Yeah. Guy Ritchie. Yeah, that, Snatch. I think Snatch might be my favorite movie of all time. I like Snatch. Uh, I and um, The Gentleman, his new the, one. Also, that was about yeah. to bring up. Yeah, The Gentleman. He made a new movie, The Gentleman, yeah. with uh, that kid from Sons of Anarchy. Uh, Charlie Hunnam. Hunnam. I saw Charlie Hunnam in a movie that I watched just last night called A Million Little Pieces. And it's about, he had a, a, an ancillary role. It's about a guy who goes into rehab for drugs and alcohol. And Charlie Hunnam is his brother who takes him to rehab. Billy Bob Thornton's in it as well. Oh. And uh, having been in the 12-step lifestyle for tw about 25 years now, I found it to be very realistic. Like I never went to rehab 
but I've heard the stories and I've seen people who've come out of rehab and I've also seen them on their way back in again. It was a really good movie and very, very realistic. How rock and roll was Montreal Radio back in the day? I don't know how rock and roll it was. I think before my day, maybe. Like, I think in the initial days of Shom, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, when Shom was on in that old mansion down on, on Green Avenue, and rock stars used to come in there, uh, and Doug Pringle was there, and Too Tall was there, and Live Earl Jive was there. I think, it was, I think that was pretty rock and roll. But it, as it got into the 80s, and I came to Montreal in 85, radio had started to go more closer to corporate it was still they were still family owned businesses but they were it was more you know business pardon me than it was rock and roll it was business before but it was a you know it was the rock and roll business yeah. and then it just became more of the uh, of the radio business i mean we partied pretty hard uh back in the day but i don't think it was anything like the uh, the initial days of show or like the u.s in the yeah. big radio market yeah i mean we probably partied as hard and maybe even harder than those guys but the, just the milieu in general wasn't it was just more business by the time i got into it and less of a you know less rock and roll have you been exposed to the french radio scene do you see what they're doing how they're getting paid and and the advertisement that goes into it and no i know that they i know they're very well compensated but they have a real market yeah well yeah. yeah that's it i mean french radio french radio in in quebec is national radio yeah. beca because it's you know i know that quebec is a province of canada but but quebec is is also its own it's a distinct it's, nation it's, it's, and it's its own place, market yeah. too like you have you know english montreal you've got a market of maybe i don't know 500,000 people uh, french radio in quebec you've got a market of 8 million yeah. And it just in Montreal, you've got a market of two to three million. So it's, yeah, it's big stuff. And, uh, you know, I think I told this story. Uh, it's, it's another one of the 10. We're down to eight now. <laughs> uh, Terry told the story about when he worked on Papineau and there were four English stations and two French stations. And yeah, you could yeah. always tell from the cars where a guy worked. If a guy drove like a, you Honda, know, Civic. a Honda Civic, he worked at one of the English stations. If he drove a Bentley... He worked at one of the French stations. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, they generate that kind of advertising dollar. So yeah. it's it's just, it's all relative, you know. But I don't know the French market that well. I just know that it's it's a much bigger and more thriving market than, um, than English Montreal. And I also don't know if French radio is going the way of English radio. I don't think in, it's dying like, uh, like English radio is. It's I not, think eh? Podcasts are taking over even French a bit. Mm -hmm. So they're, I don't know if they're losing listeners. Maybe they're sharing listeners and they're losing some but they're still going to be able to thrive. There's a whole market out there for people to listen to the radio and the regular TV shows and kind of the old school way of doing yeah. things. On the English scene, I'm telling you, man, radio is dying. Yeah, it's legacy media in general. I mean, look at the Gazette, the Montreal Gazette. The, the weekend Montreal Gazette, the Saturday Montreal Gazette, is now the same size physically as the Daily Gazette used to be. And the Daily Gazette is the same size as a flyer used to yeah. be in the Weekly Gazette. I mean, there's just, there's nothing to it anymore. I remember how thick it was when I was growing up. Yeah. yeah. And television as well. How many people are watching TV these days compared to compared to, to streaming services? The only thing I watch on, on, on regular television now is... Uh, news and sports like a, a hockey game or a football game or whatever any entertainment i go for any series any movie i'm watching stuff off netflix or prime or whatever like most people yeah well same thing with podcasts and I'm, I'm a little shocked that the uh legacy media here hasn't tried to aggressively pivot properly they're just dying a slow death it's like it's like those uh mom and pop stores in the late 90s when they were like, hey, maybe you should think about a website. And they're like, ah, this internet thing is going to blow over. Mm. They're acting like the internet is going to blow over and we're going to get back to legacy media. It's not. They need to adapt or they will die. Yeah. I don't know why there's no one there with that kind of thought. Well, you would think that, you know, multi-billion dollar companies like Bell and, and Chorus, which is along with Side Bell is one of the biggest radio uh, owners in the country. I don't know what Chorus is television interests are but bell is certainly huge in radio and tv you would think that somebody at the top would be going hey guys we got to figure out how to as you said pivot that's the perfect word for it and i don't know i don't know if they have i you know i think bell is is fairly active in in digital media and terry says that what bell has ended up doing is they're using their radio properties basically as platforms to advertise 
yeah. their, their digital properties. The, the only issue is that no one's, well, no one, there's a lot fewer people listening. Younger people to their don't legacies. listen. My so kids who are you advertising yeah. to? My kids don't listen to the radio. Exactly. The only time my kids listen to the radio is if they're in the car with their mother and their mom has the radio on. The, the people you're advertising to? are not going to go on the internet right now. The people that are still listening that don't aren't aware of how this stuff works, they're not going to transition. So it's just wasted advertising dollars. It's the weirdest experiment that they're trying. Yeah. I think the future of radio is probably uh, an example of the future of radio is the station I work at right now in Hudson. It's a small community focused yeah. station and it's not a money generator like the big stations in the big city are. But there's a reason if you're there to check in. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, it's local. It's yeah. relatable. It does what our station does what radio is supposed to do. It's local, and it's intimate, and it's immediate. And and the advertising dollars are not huge compared to uh, to the big city, but what that means is that advertisers are getting better bang for their buck. Yeah. They don't have to pay a whole lot of money, and they can be local and, and, and market to a local audience and yeah, that little radio station I'm at, that it only went on the air five or six years ago. And with, with virtually no marketing, uh, we've established a nice little niche and a good audience. And our sales director, uh, who's also my ex-wife, told me uh, or, or said at a meeting not too long ago that, I forget if she said that advertising revenues were up 200% or the, I think she said they exceeded their budget by 200%. If you were still married to her, they would have been 500%. Yeah, seriously. I thought to myself, 200%, <laughs> hey, well, where's my raise? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's good because th that, that's why I like to hear that kind of stuff because if you don't evolve, you die. I've learned this. Yeah. And it's strange to see smaller markets are putting in more effort, more thought into the way media is going and okay, how do we stay relevant? And then these bigger markets are letting it slip away, are letting it slip away. They're so lazy about it. They're yeah. just, they think it's going to work out automatically. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, uh, you can't, and you can't always cite history as, as a precedent. You know, when TV came along, a lot of people went, oh, TV, that's going to be the death of radio. Well, it wasn't the death of radio. Two but, different mediums. But this is a, this is a whole different ball game. The oh, internet yeah, and digital media and, and music streaming and podcasts. It's a whole different ball game. And, and, and legacy media is under siege. In a big way, I know I'm. Uh, I'm not too. I'm not too worried about us because uh, I think we're going to be at the forefront for a while. Well, yeah, you guys, you guys are are part of the new media. You're yeah. part of the new wave, and that's why Terry and I are so excited to to have gotten in with you guys. And as I said on on standing by, you know, we're lucky that we got in on the uh, we got in on the penthouse floor. You guys have been doing this for a long time, and you're well established. I mean, you've been on the friggin' Joe Rogan show for Christ's sake. It doesn't get any more. That's as that's as lofty as it gets. It's as lofty as it gets. I got lofty goals. Let me tell you, I got <laughs> I got bigger yeah. bigger fish to fry. And I don't want to, you know, I shouldn't just say that you guys uh, have made it because you've been on the Joe Rogan show. You've made it on your own. You guys have got fantastic and well well rated uh, ratings is not the right word. What's the word in podcasting I don't for know. ratings? Streams, downloads, yeah, views. Yeah. I mean, you guys have got, that, you guys have got a big audience. That's how I cal I calculated now from shows. Uh, I calculated from when I do a show either in English and French, and there's people wearing our T-shirts. Uh, there's podcast fans. When when somebody mentions podcasts, they erupt uh, the way they are after the shows. That's how I gauge. I'm like, okay, we're doing something right because well, you you're connecting. You, you told me that before we started today, you told me the story about Quebec City, was, which is a great story. Just when uh, the uh, host asked, are you guys just all podcast fans? And the whole room just erupted. I was like, fuck, this is crazy. Because 10 years ago when I started podcasting, everyone thought... This is, what are you wasting your time for? This is yeah. so stupid. No one's going to listen to podcasts. And then a room full of people in in my third language, I guess, were there to see me. And uh, they're like, yeah, we're, we listen to podcasts in multiple languages, English, French, whatever the fuck this guy gives us, we'll listen. That's something that I've always yeah. found so cool. As someone who grew up as a unilingual Anglophone in New Brunswick, guys like you and, and Poseidon, and so many people I've met in Montreal over the years, you guys grew up trilingual. Yeah. So you speak English, French, Greek. and Greek, right? Greek from home, I assume. And school. And school, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, English, um, just from exposure to the, the from, English culture, I guess, and partly school, school as well, TV. yeah. And French from the street. No, French from school. Really? Eh? Yeah. Anyway, all of that to say, it always impressed the shit out of me to meet people who could effortlessly switch from one language to the next and and in three in three different languages and i know for you guys that's just a 
you probably don't give it a second thought because that's how you grew up. But I, but let me tell you, as uh, as someone who is pretty much still unilingual, parce que mon français est une vraie catastrophe, um, it's it's a really it's an impressive thing, and I think it's something that you should take uh, a, a great deal of pride in. I just always thought it was the the greatest thing because the only my exposure to French growing up in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Fredericton is, I think, it's the country's only officially bilingual capital because New Brunswick is an officially bilingual province. But all the French people are in the north and the east, and everywhere else, it's all English. There's really not there's not a mixed community at all. And so, when I was a kid, uh, all of our all of our French friends, and they were Acadians. There are that's another thing that I found out. There are names that you hear down east, French names that you hear down east that you very seldom hear up here. Acadian names like Arsenault, uh, Melancon, yeah. Cormier, uh, French names, but you don't hear them much in Quebec. They're very Acadian names. But when we were kids, for example, Claudette Melancon, who lived up the street from me, was not Claudette Melancon. Claudette Melancon. Did, did Claudette speak French? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Yvonne Michaud, who lived right next Ivan? to him. Ivan Michaud. Yeah, Claudette Melanson and Ivan Michaud. That's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. So it just goes to show you how, even though it's an officially bilingual province, the, uh, you know, it's still two, it's two separate entities. And, and the, the Francophones, the Acadians, uh, certainly adjusted to the Anglophone culture around them better than, than the Anglophones ever adjusted to the Acadian culture. Cause we never had to. Yeah. We never that. had to. Yeah. Even in Montreal, all this time in Montreal, I'm still not as bilingual as I should be because I'm still able to work and live in an English milieu out on the West fantasy Island and in Hudson. Yeah. You know what I did notice a lot of people on the West Island, even young people don't speak French or can't rather properly. And it's shocking. Yeah. Well, again, it's because they're living in an English milieu. But it's not real. Like, I grew up in a, in a Greek subculture yeah. of Montreal. I still speak three languages. Yeah. Three of my four kids are multilingual. My daughter uh, is speaks English, French, and Italian because her mom is Italian, St. Michelle Italian. Uh, two of my kids uh, who grew up in the West Island speak English and French because they both went to French elementary school. And uh, my other boy, Charlie... Uh, he only ever went to English school, so his French is like mine, although he swears in French way better than I do. He does a really good French swear. He actually has a pretty good Haitian French accent as well. Oh, he does the Creole? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's just from he's grown up in Montreal his whole life. So he's, uh, even though he's not, you know, fluently bilingual, he knows the accent and he knows the mannerisms and he knows the expressions in French. He's a good French swearer. I, I'm a good French swear too. Yeah, I'll bet. I, I try to swear less in French because I feel it takes because uh, of my accent. It doesn't. The aggression doesn't come out as much. It's funny. It's like Santa Claus swearing. Yeah, like, I, like <laughs> you know, this goofy element, son of a bitch. An added element for guys like you and Poseidon growing up Greek is that you not only do you know a third language, you know another alphabet. Yeah. Fuck. Well, we read, write in Greek. I yeah? watch uh, all my sports in Greek. Really? Uh, eh? Yeah, I read the newspaper every day. Uh, the sports stuff. I always catch up with my team. So, and again, I assume that's just something that that you you just learned as a matter of course growing up. Eh? It's not something you sat down and okay, no, I'm I sat learn, down. I'm going to learn the Greek alphabet now. Well, I was in school, right? So it was yeah. uh, my school. It was French, English, and Greek. Okay. Greek was the uh, third language in the school. The first language was French, and then English, and then Greek. However, because I spoke Greek at home, and I would watch a lot of Greek TV. Um, my parents were Greek, you know, my mom, it kind of stayed with me more than, than French did, even though French was the dominant yeah. language in school, because all my friends would speak English and I would be exposed to English TV as well. Uh, and then in high school, there was no more Greek, but I had already got all my base and I'm more fluent in Greek than I am in French, which is weird because I did all my schooling in French. Yeah. Well, but I mean, if you're, you know, if Greek is the language or was the language at home. That's then, why. Yeah. That's why, yeah. That, all, that also makes sense. I mean, I'm more fluent in, in Greek technically than English. You just wouldn't know it. Yeah. 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 Have you been to Greece many times? Yep. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Do you go back to where your family's from? Yeah, I go all over. Uh, I haven't been since 2017, what with the pandemic and all. I'm planning on going next year. I want to catch a couple of soccer games and just uh, enjoy myself. But even in Greece, when I'd go down with my friends from here, uh, everyone would recognize their accents and know that they're foreigners. Mm -hmm. And they would always ask me, 
Well, but I'm with them. But they yeah. would always ask me, so uh, where are these foreigners from? Like, uh, are they friends of yours? Are your family? <laughs> really? Eh? Yeah, and I would always fuck with them. Yeah, they, they would, or sometimes they would think one of my buddy, my buddy Milton. At one point, they thought he was uh, Albanian, and then I had to explain the guy. He's not an Albanian. He's he's Greek. He's just from from Montreal, as am I. And the guy's like, no, nah, no, stop fucking around. This guy's accent. This guy's clearly Albanian. It's not a Greek guy. And I was like, no, that's a he's a Greek guy from Montreal. I was like, then why do you speak it like a normal person? Why does he sound like that? I go, I don't know. Why do some Albanians speak Greece? Yo, there's that a lot of Albanians Greek? in Greek. It's yeah. the uh, it's a neighboring well, country. Right next to each other, right? So you know you have it's kind of like let's say when I speak French, you could tell there's an accent. Same thing Albanians in Greece. There's mm-hmm. an accent if they weren't born there. You know you have a little bit of an accent, yeah. Yeah. so you can tell. So they would think even though we went to the same school, we had the same lifestyle. I'm fluent in that language, and a lot of my friends they anglicize it, kind of like how people do here with French. You know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I want to get uh, you know, je rentre dans mon car or whatever when they yeah, mix yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't do that. When I speak a language, I want to speak fully in that language. Same thing in French. I don't try to use crutches in English. I try to keep it when I'm doing stand up in French, just French. Yeah, that makes sense. I find it it destroys the communication when you switch too often. Like commit. If yeah. you can speak it, fucking commit to it. Yeah. Well, especially if you're in a place where it's. Uh, you know, if you're if you're in a place that's you know ninety nine percent francophone, yeah, then yeah, commit to the French for sure. Um, getting back to Greece, the most beautiful place I've ever been, uh, and I haven't seen the whole world, but I've seen quite a bit of it. Santorini. Oh, Santorini's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and I know it's very touristy, but it's touristy for a reason because it's yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I went to Greece in. It's expensive uh, now. It is, eh? Yeah. It is. Is that right, eh? Because when I I went in two thousand two, and it still wasn't too bad. Oh, it's more expensive in 2002. I'll, I'll guarantee you that. Yeah. Because it's become a hot spot for uh, not just any tourist. It's become a hot spot, certain places, for high end tourists. Okay. So, high end weddings, honeymoons, mm-hmm. uh, stars will go there. And then they'll, it's part of their trip. Then there'll be yachts involved afterward. So, like uh, when the UFC guys go down there, Dana White, they'll end up places like that. Okay. Yeah. That'll yeah. drive the price up. Well, good. I'm glad I went when I did. We did two islands. When we went to the, to Greece, we did Santorini and we did Skiathos. I don't know if you know Skiathos, Skiathos yeah. at all, but it two completely different islands because Santorini's volcanic, right? T- here's the thing, though. Technically, they're all supposed to be volcanic. Well, Skiathos is lush and green. It was oh, a, okay, that's yeah. what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very. It was a. It was. Um, well, Crete has that issue too, where you'll go to a certain place, it'll be like a desert on the island of Crete, and then other place it'll be green. Yeah, but it's all a mountainous. Because I guess, I, I don't know how, uh, I got to remember my history, but the way all those islands existed, because initially I, there was a, an explosion, right? There was a fucking other landmass there, mm-hmm. and then it turned all to islands. It wasn't always like that. So I thought it was because of a volcanic eruption that the way Greece and the islands exist today is because of that. But I guess that's prehistoric. Yeah, I think the uh, I think that uh, according to mythology, the lost city of Atlantis is is under Santorini. Day. Yeah, yeah, I know it's. it's yeah. I know it's much. According to mythology, shit, I think yeah. it was the sons of Deucalion. I think it was a giant or a titan that was throwing rocks behind him that made all the islands or something like that. Yeah. It was him. It was Poseidon, the god of the sea. <laughs> if, if Poseidon was any of the gods, he was Zeus because Zeus was known to transform into animals to bang women. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. You didn't really? know that? Hey, no. Where do we yeah, sign well, up for that? Yeah, he would. But because I, I was talking about it on stage too, it's a little. It, Poseidon was the person, the first person to make me think about this. It feels like it was just people with shitty excuses, right? Like they would get like, Costa, were you fucking a sheep? Like, no. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was Aphrodite. She, she, yeah. She's a shapeshifter. shapeshifter. <laughs> That's, That's what it funny. was, yeah. That's great. <laughs> See, Poseidon, it's evolving. You're liking it, where it's going, yeah. Because he wanted to always give me a joke I could say on stage. <laughs> and he started talking about the Greek gods transforming. And I've been working on it on stage so we could make it into a good bit. And now he feels... Very implicated in my art, and he's excited. That's good. I don't yeah. know my Greek mythology very well. Crete is somewhere I've always wanted to visit because I'm a World War II history buff, and there was a substantial battle fought on Crete. Operation early, Mercury. Is that what it was yeah, called? The, early that, in the war. Operation Mercury, it was the first victory of the Allies was uh, in Crete. Uh, Operation Mercury was the last time that the Nazis used uh, paratroopers because the Cretans, uh, including old ladies who were gunless, slaughtered them. Really? Uh, yeah, eh? and it was the that um, defense is what started to cause the resistance. It mm-hmm. was the first ally. Imagine, out of all of Europe, the first ally victory in Europe was uh, on the island of Crete. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't on the island of Crete. The first uh, victory they had was in uh, in Italy, Albania, when the Italians tried to go over, and the Greeks sent them back. Yeah. And then what happened in Crete, Operation Mercury, was when the um, 
the paratroopers. They said, we need Crete. That was going to be their base of operations so they could fly everywhere. And they were trying to land. And all the Cretans were like, well, we're not going to let these fucking Nazis land. So they were stabbing them at, on their way down, stealing their guns and shooting the other ones from Jesus. the sky. So it was a massacre. It was just floating Nazis ready to get killed. And then uh, there was guerrilla warfare. They're, the Cretans were hiding in the mountains, coming down at night, slaughtering, taking weapons, going back. And the, the Nazis were never safe because old ladies would attack them. So they'd see little old ladies with veils and they'd go you know, try to take over a house or a village. And the old ladies would pull out machetes. And uh, so it was very hard for them. And because of that, they delayed the war effort to Russia. They had to go to Russia in the winter, and they got fucked. Yeah. yeah, and there was always a price to pay for that too, though, because there were reprisals. And I've seen I've seen stories and I've seen photographs. Yeah, of they some massacred of the, villages. Some of the Nazi reprisals in in Crete, pretty ugly stuff. Very uh, all over. There was a we talked about some other show once. I think it was in French. There was there was places in Greece where the Nazis were so angry when there was Greek victories that they would take it out on the villages. And there was some place in Greece that what they would do is they would kill every boy and man in the village completely, whether it was a baby, toddler, anything. After the war, there were spots where they had to send Greeks. Greek men had to move to different, sp to try to repopulate because yeah. there was no one left. Wow. Yeah. They did some horrendous things, but then you know who else did horrendous things? Uh, us to ourselves, the civil war. Yeah. I don't know the history uh, of the Greek was, civil war is bad. Yeah. It was communists versus, uh, I guess, I don't want to say the democratically elected because then we had a junta, but it, it was a Greek, it was brother versus brother. Yeah. And it was bad. It was, we did some heinous shit to each other. Yeah. Well, yeah. civil war is ugly uh, anywhere and at any level. Yeah. Yeah. But I love, uh, there's nothing that I love more than, uh, than being Greek. I can tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I feel uh, honored. Great pride. Yeah. Great yeah. pride. Blessed. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know what I am. I think I'm, uh, my, my mother's family was McFarlane. And like my, of the great Todd McFarlane tribe? <laughs> <laughs> well, from Scotland, obviously. But here's a story for you. Mm. Uh, I went to Scotland about, it was 1988, I went over to Scotland. And we were up in, uh, in Loch Lomond, where the Loch Ness Monster supposedly resides. And they have a place up there called the Tartan Clan Center, where if you're a descendant of a clan, you can go in and they'll dress you up in the, in, uh, the kilt and the tartan and the whole nine yards. They'll put the whole kit on you and take your picture. And I said, if you're part of a clan, if you're part, if you're descended from a clan. And I said, let's go. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get put on the McFarland stuff. You have pictures? And, no. Well, here's the story. I go in there and I said, okay, I want to do the uh, thing where I dress up in my, uh, in my clan tartan and you take my picture. And they said, okay, what's your name? And I said, bird. And they said, well, that's not, a, that's not a clan name. And I said, well, I said, that's my, my father's name, but my mother was a McFarlane. And they said, well, when your mother married out of the clan, then uh, that was the end of that. So I'm, oh, shit. I'm afraid we can't help you. They wouldn't let me put the shit on and take my picture. They were, and they were adamant. You're out of the clan, Ted. Yeah, I'm out of the clan. You it know? feels like Survivor. Yeah, they were happy to sell me, you know, McFarland tea towels and shit like that. You know, buy all the McFarland souvenirs you want, but we're not taking your picture. You can't put the gear on and we're not taking your picture because your mother married out of the clan, so that's it. So your lineage broke. Yeah. But wait, out of the clan, what was your mother supposed to do? Find another McFarland? I don't know, I guess. And yeah. You would have you would have been well, a mongoloid. Was, yeah. <laughs> she wasn't supposed to find another McFarland. She was supposed to marry, I guess she was supposed to marry another Scottish person, and then I could have, you know, got my picture taken in their, uh, in their clan gear. I have this tattoo on my, oh, it's the other arm. Christ, I don't even know what arm my tattoo's on. Let's see this. This is the only tattoo I have. I got it in 2004, and it's held its color very nicely. I got it at Slick Style Steel. Sir, that is a swastika. Dead <laughs> <laughs> birds and Nancy. I got it at Slick Style Steel up on... Uh, when they were up on Saint Laurent, they did a really nice job. Oh, that's cool! So, yeah, yeah, it's the Bird family crest. My grandparents came home from England one time with this wall crest of the Bird coat of arms, right? So I thought I'll get that for a tattoo, and then I uh, and then I find out afterwards it's the wrong family. You got someone else's it's, family well, tattooed on you. It's the Bird crest, but it's the Bird crest from England, and my family came from Northern Ireland. Oh, shit. So the only saving grace is that my family is Protestant, and this tattoo has the cross of St. George on it. Right. So so it's at least, you know... I'm Protestant. In, yeah, I'm in the general neighborhood, but, but if I ever go to the Republic of Ireland, where most people are Catholic, I'd have to wear long sleeves the whole time. Oh, they, they get mad at that? I don't know how mad they get, but it's a, you know, it has the, it has the I believe it's called the cross of St. George. 
And so that's it, them's fighting words. Yeah, well, that would mark me as a loyalist to the British crown. Well, you did get a British tattoo, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> you, can't, you know, it's funny that you bring that up. You know, I've been thinking about the past couple of days. Sh- if family crests are still a thing, should I create one? Because that's not a thing with Greeks. It's but I would, not, li- eh? I would like to create know? a family crest. I want my dog, Shiva, because she's like a little uh, Yorkie. Okay. I want her to be the animal on it. Okay, well, yeah. Yorkies aren't very Greek, are they? Are there, They're not. Is there a Greek breed of dog, a breed of dog uh, specific to An Greeks? asshole. I believe the Greek dogs are assholes. Uh, no, there's, there's, there are Greek dogs. I, I think they come here too. They, they bring them over when you adopt them. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of dogs in Greece. Uh, I've become a big dog guy. But I just thought that I should create a family crest for myself. Okay. And then I thought it might be a stupid idea. But now that I see that, people are still doing it. Is there not any kind of uh, family symbol in Greek culture? We don't have crests in, unless maybe the royals might have had, but we don't we don't we don't like yeah. royals. I think we That's don't do true. that shit because we I hate royal families. It's a, it's a very Anglo-Saxon thing, isn't it? Yeah, coat of arms. Yeah, they yeah. they no one else does it, and Greeks don't like royalty. Okay, they hate it. So I guess it's always associated. I want to do it more for the for the fun of it. I think it'd be hilarious, especially to have a people have lines and stuff, and I would have a, a Yorkie. I think there's something funny about that. Uh, but I was thinking about going to a designer, maybe the people that design our logos, and getting a family crest done. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Is Pantelis your first name or your last name? First name. Okay. My last name is Paliudakis, so it would be the okay. Paliudakis All right. clan. Yeah. 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 There's a World War II movie about Greece, about the Greeks and the Italians, called Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Mandolin. You yes. ever see that? Of course, with Nicolas Cage. Yeah, Nicolas yeah. Cage and um, Penelope Cruz. And Christian Bale. Is Christian Bale on that yeah, too? Yeah, he played a Greekster. He played the guy who was in love with Penelope Cruz. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's not a bad movie. It wasn't a bad movie. And recently I was waiting for my car to get uh, fixed at Ford. And it was playing in French on TV. And I was sitting watching Gavin Corelli's Mandolin in French. <laughs> it was pretty good. I'm not the biggest Nicolas Cage fan. He's pretty hit and miss. Mm. You know, he's, He takes he, on every role. Well, yeah, when he's good, he's good. But when he's bad, he's bad sort of thing. But that was a good movie. It was enjoyable. Yeah, yeah I liked it. Yeah. yeah Listen to me criticizing Nicolas Cage. Like, he's a big... I'm sure he's got all, all of my albums. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's crazy about Nicolas Cage? From what I had heard, uh, I guess he had made some terrible investments. This guy bought, like, a house in every state. Mansions. So after a while, when his career started to dip, he still had to pay mortgages and all that stuff. Right. So that's what screwed him over. He's like, shit, I got to keep making movies. Just sell some fucking houses, Nick Cage. You don't need to keep them all. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah, he's uh, and also a lot of these guys they get screwed over by uh, by their wives. A lot of these guys they get successful and they don't have a, a good prenup or they don't have a good agreement with with these with these women and they get fleeced. Yeah, they get taken that, yeah. the cleaners. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. Well, again, I, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about you know take care of your money, man. Yeah, you got to take like, care of your like, money. Keep an eye on it. Be be aware of what's going on with your money. Well, Dane Cook, I don't know if you heard this story. Dane Cook spoke about this on a podcast. Dane Cook was broke. He he was a mi- he made millions, and his brother, who was in charge of his finances, robbed him. His own brother. His own brother. That sucks. His own brother screwed. Like, I heard that. You know how bad I felt for Dane Cook? Like, of all people, it's not like an accountant. Um, your own brother stole your money. Just kept lying. Oh, yeah, this is going there, this is going there, and it was uh, all, you know, taken away from him. That sucks. Yeah. So I guess he had to come to do a comeback to bring back his career. Yeah. Uh, to try to make some money, but yeah, people get fucked over all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I like to operate like this. I like to be in control of everything, see what's going on. Not too big. Yeah. You got to be savvy. I'm not savvy. I'm not. I'm not money savvy. So you've got to be savvy, or you have to have someone who is savvy who you trust implicitly. Yeah. But it's hard to find that person. It's very hard to find yeah. that person. You yeah. you need you need people. What I do is I I break it up. So let's say to file my taxes, I have professionals filing them, right? Mm-hmm. I'll pay you to file it. But for the day-to-day to transactions, where's the money going, paying the bills, I do everything because I don't want to get a surprise. Yeah. Of what? Where did $800 go? Oh, it's consulting. Like, you know, you, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. you don't want that kind of stuff. So you, uh, you you take care of yourself. But then again, we had no choice because we when we started, we started in the basement. I mean, when I started podcasting, I didn't even know Poseidon and I was in my buddy Alex's basement. So uh, we didn't have anything. So where did you guys, how did you, how did the three of you, you and Mike and, and Poseidon, how did you guys hook up? Uh, we were at an orgy. <laughs> yeah. Poseidon I don't took, want to hear the rest of the story. Poseidon took the apple out of his mouth. <laughs> uh, no, uh, me and Mike met by chance on, uh, in a very fortuitous uh, circumstance for myself. Uh, I was thinking of quitting comedy. 
and it was probably going to be my last stand-up set because in Montreal, as you know, on the English scene, you kind of plateau. Yep. So I felt like I had made all the right moves. I was getting better. I was going to the States, but I would not get the industry. The industry here is small. It's just, just for laughs. I wouldn't get the respect from the industry. I would get nothing. I wouldn't get homegrown. I wouldn't get any opportunities. I would audition for just for laughs. I would do well at the auditions, but they would never put me up for anything. So I figured, all right, maybe I'm wasting my time. So I was about, I think it was February 20, what was it, Poseidon, 2018? Uh, 2018, maybe February 2018? Maybe before, 17, I remember, I think 2018. And uh, I was on my way to a show, it was at a bike shop, it was shitty weather. And I was like, I can't cancel. I've you were on your way to a show at a bike shop? Yeah, it was just a shitty Saturday night show. And uh, I, But at a bike shop? I was at a bike shop, yeah, where they repair bicycles, like a hipster place. So there was a comedy show at a bike shop? Yep. Really? Oh, yeah. You could tell the, the that level. Sounds like, that sounds like something that I would see if I was on acid. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So I head over there, and I was thinking, of, but I've never canceled a gig. I always show up. So I was like, you know what? If it's this my last gig, I'm not going to cancel. I'll go mm. fucking do the show. And Mike was invited to that show, too. And uh, Mike had heard. I, I knew who Mike was. Yeah. Mike didn't know who I was. He had heard of me, like, talk around the city, but he never saw me. He didn't know. He's like, I heard some stuff about, about Pantels, but whatever, what's the big deal? And then I was talking to people backstage. I was uh, bullying everyone and just having, the way I am with you, just yeah, having yeah. a good time, busting balls. Yeah. And Mike was just observing. And then I went on on stage. I, I went in front of the people sitting on uh, mattresses. And uh, Mike liked the set. And then the next day, he sent me a message. And he goes, look, uh, I saw you yesterday. I, I like your set. And, you know, you're pretty funny. Uh, I got an offer to do a podcast. This was Two Drink Minimum was building. Okay. And he tried it with a couple of other people. Because mm -hmm. when he got the offer from Compound Media, He's like, oh, fuck, you know, Opie and Anthony, all that history. I would love to do a podcast with him. But he didn't want to fly down to New York every week. It's a, You know, he's got shows. It's a pain. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he wanted to do it from Montreal. And he tried it with a couple of people, some comedians in you here. And it just wouldn't, the flow wasn't working. Okay. But he saw in me uh, that style that I had, which was, uh, I don't have a Canadian style. I had a New York style of comedy. And that's what he wanted. And you were already podcasting. I was at this already point. podcasting, okay. but he didn't know this. Okay. To his credit, he didn't know. He just felt it. And then I told him, "Well, if you're serious, I have my own studio." That's when I had rented and I was had a studio on Cremazy. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah. you were there at that one. So he uh, he's like, "Oh shit! All right, let's go try it." So we did a trial run. We sent the hour to uh, Compound Media so they could check it out. I guess Keith saw it. He's like, "Oh fuck, who's this guy? This works. You know, this actually this this episode works." So we did a, a live test uh, at the Bordel, just a live show, me and him, see if the flow was still there. We just clicked from the beginning. It was like the, the brother I never had. It was Mike, you know? Yeah. And then he took me under his wing. And from then, uh, he opened up like every door uh, possible for me. You know, uh, he brought me into the podcasting mainstream. Um, he introduced me to, you know, all those guys at Compound Media, all these other comics that I met. Uh, here in French, he's opening doors for me just for laughs. I got in because of him because the first time I got in just for laughs was for two drink minimum, which would have never been anything if it wasn't for Mike. And then it just started snowballing from there. But it was all uh, by chance. It was that night that I went there. It was the night that he was there. He was thinking of not doing his podcast because he couldn't find a co-host. And you were thinking about giving up stand up. I was thinking Isn't about that giving up stand up. Eh? Yeah. Wow. So, so sometimes you see these moments in movies and you're like, I wonder if that really happened. Yeah. Now I, I lived one of those moments. So I was like, oh, shit, sometimes these moments do happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think they probably happen more often than we realize. And we don't the thing think about is to, You have to recognize it and uh, and seize the opportunity. So at Compound Media, did that run its course, or did you guys make a conscious decision to say, you know what, we're going to we're gonna do our own thing? Oh, we, yeah, we wanted to leave a year before we left. Yeah. Uh, just to do our own thing. We didn't want to be behind a paywall. We wanted to be free on YouTube and iTunes and all that stuff. And we were going to leave initially. We said, look, uh, we, we want to just do our own thing. And then they were like, no, nah, like, can you just stick around a bit? Because uh, it's going to look bad. Because I think they had just lost another show. I don't know if it was when Malice left or when Artie Lang was. But they had just lost another show. So they go, it would look fucking weird. And they were right. It would have looked odd if everybody's leaving. But we didn't leave because of any other decision. We were, uh, we had tunnel vision. We were just focused on growing two drink minimum. Yeah. So we said, okay, we'll do, uh, we'll start releasing some episodes Every week we'll do one for you guys and we'll do one that goes public or we'll do one for you guys, but then a day later it'll be public, something like that. So we did that for a couple of months and then we're like, all right, now we're just going to go full public. We don't want to, like, we're still, we're still friends with everyone, but it had nothing to do with them. It was for us. We wanted to be, you know, cause we were the only show that was outside of New York and I guess we had taken all the, we were known by the people in the tri-state area as much as we could be as outsiders because it's easier when you're there because you could do local shows, so you grow bigger. But now we got that base, you know? 
uh, we need to expand, especially in Canada. So we were having fans in New York, fans in Philadelphia, and then there was people in Montreal that didn't know that we were doing a show. So it was kind of weird. Yeah. So uh, we made the decision to then go. So they understood. Like, no, we get it. You know, there was no, it, it wasn't like a hateful thing. It was just you. you oh, got, that's good. Yeah. yeah oh, we're that's still good. friends. Yeah. yeah Anthony, we're still that's friends good. with all of them. Are they, is that still a, is compound media still a force in the, uh, in the podcast it's, world? It's, st- it's still a, a force. It's not as big as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, ebbs and flows and with everything that happened, I think they got bigger during COVID because more people sign up during, right. uh, but I, I think the model, I think the model for uh, podcasting with a paywall, the people that do it the best are uh, the people at Gas Digital. I think they figured it out the best way to do it because that's that's how I see a paid model working for podcasting. So Luis J. Gomez, uh, um, Sutton, I guess, is with him, and uh, they have uh, obviously Legion of Skanks. Malice is there. They have all these yeah, shows. Yeah, I know those guys. Yeah, so what, what they do, which I like, is so uh, if you're behind the paywall, you get to watch the shows live. So you're paying, you're watching it live, and then that's one of the advantages you have with the entire back catalog of shows. But then after it runs its course, let's say a couple of days or whenever they determine, then the shows are everywhere on iTunes, uh, YouTube. So even people that are not subscribed are going to get exposed to your podcast. And the people that like it get to sign up. They pay monthly. They get their shows live. They get the entire back catalog. They get the chat. They get the forums. So you could go in there and use the live chat. Um, I think Luis J. Gomez really figured it out how to create a business. He's the Legion of Skanks guy. Yeah, yeah right? he's on Legion of Skanks. Yeah. yeah, so he figured out how, first of all, he's good at podcasting. Okay. He's good at podcasting already. That, that's one thing. You have to be talented in that. But he's also figured out the business aspect of it of, yeah, you need some exclusivity, but you also can't fully be closed because you can't get new fans. If you're fully closed, nobody knows what you're offering. So the people that are subscribing, they get the benefits of watching you live, chatting, you know, getting access to stuff first, getting the entire back catalog. But then you have to release your videos and your um, audio to everyone so that exponentially it grows. Because let's say people love your show, but for some reason they can't subscribe. They don't have the five, ten bucks a month. There's a million reasons why they can't subscribe. They still like you. They want to support you. They'll come out to the shows. So there's no reason to not have your podcast available for free out there. Yeah. You know? Why do you think stand-up comics are at the leading edge of podcasting versus broadcasters? Because we never shut up. We like to talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think a lot of it has to do with real stand-up comedians. And I say this about uh, you know, mostly New York comics. I, I like the way New York comics are. Um, they're real in the sense that they're all different, but you get that person. The real ones, you get that. That's who they are, right? Yeah. They, they, they don't leave a lot to the imagination. And that's what people want. People are tired of, is this guy putting on a fucking act? People don't have time for that shit anymore. They want to connect with you. Yeah. And, you know, we don't really have a filter. Most comics don't have a filter. It's a, f- it's a form of our autism. It just comes out. So you like hearing like-minded people say stuff that you can't say at the workplace. You also like the fact that they're consistent and you're used to you're used to listening to their voice, just like the radio used to be. There's no, um, every five minutes, they're not reminding you of what fucking time it is or what the weather's like. And it's just, we're good at that. We like the banter. And it could go on and on. And people like hearing people talk. Yeah, it's people a great, like being part of the conversation. It's a great point you make about people getting to know who you really are. And this is another one of the 10 stories. So we're down to seven. Uh, Terry and I worked have both worked with a radio consultant named Valerie Geller. And okay. Valerie Geller, who for my money is the best radio consultant in North America, says the highest compliment anyone can pay you as a radio personality is, I feel like I know you. Yes. And I'll bet you that's what people say about you and Mike and Poseidon if yep. they're watching Two Drink Minimum yeah. uh, on the regular. And the no filter thing reminds me of a clip I've seen. It's it's one of the greatest single podcast clips I've ever seen. I've never laughed so hard, I don't think. Joey Diaz <laughs> yeah. Yeah. is on with, he's a guest with Tom. Segura? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I... I, I'm not going to try to recreate the scene, but it's he's talking about having sex with a one-legged woman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen it. I, I, a long time it, ago. Yeah. It, is, it is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life, and it's so unfiltered, and it's so jarringly funny. And whoever the woman who is, is who's on with Tom Segura, uh, Segura, is that his yeah, name? On Tom Segura's show? Yes. That's his wife. 
What's her name? Christina Pachinski. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a couple of times she's going, Joey! <laughs> Joey! <laughs> he is so funny. Yeah. And, and, but all three and of those unfiltered. people are funny. And that, yeah. 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 You're talking I, about I your mom's house. they were a married couple. Yeah. Your yeah. mom's house you're talking about, right? That's their, their Is that show? the name of the podcast? Yeah. I don't know. I just saw the clip one day and I don't know how She's I came blonde? Ac- yes. Yeah, that's his wife. I yeah. don't know how I came across it, but I thought to myself, holy shit, man, that, that is so good. That's a good, funny. So good. Yeah, yeah. he's he's excellent. Yeah. He's and excellent. And him, I like he's one of the uh, he's one of the guys I like because on stage he does he's a storyteller. Mm-hmm. And initially when I was starting out in comedy, people thought that that w- was a problem, that I was telling stories. They wanted jokes. Yeah, they just wanted set, you know, just the set up punchline, set up punchline. And I was like, "Fuck, maybe I can't do this." Like they're having fun, but I keep hearing from comedians, "No, you can't do that. You can't do long jokes and stories. Nobody does that. You have to do this." And I just continued because my style is that I like storytelling. Mm-hmm. And then I saw guys like him, and they were successful. They were. I was like, "Fuck that! I could do fucking stories." Yeah, Nate absolutely. Brigazzi fucking does yeah. stories too. Like if you're good at telling stories, Joey Diaz, one of his powers is he's a good storyteller. Yeah. So, uh, I, so I always appreciate Tom Segura because, because I, I think he was the, the guy that I was like, oh yeah, fuck, I could tell stories. Yeah, well, I, I think it's really important to be yourself. I think you've got your best shot, whether you're on stage or behind a microphone. I think your best shot is is at being yourself and playing to your strengths. Yeah. There's a comedian named Will Franken. Okay. Do you know who Will Franken is? No. Nope. He uh, he's an American guy, and he's I think he might still be in the UK. He went over to the UK, and. Um, and and made his living over there and i'm going to send you the clip to the segment there's a there's a comedy club in england i believe it's still there called comedy unleashed okay and their whole thing is funny is funny and they don't give a shit if someone's offended by a joke it's funny is funny good period and so they'll put comedians up there uh, regardless of the material, regardless of what direction it if takes, regardless, funny. as long as it's funny, if somebody gets offended, that's their problem. Yeah. You know, I like that. that's how it should be. Yeah. And Will Franken does a whole, Will Franken is almost like, uh, he, he's an actor comedian and he does about a 25 minute segment. It's on YouTube and it's about Greta Thunberg and, uh, transgender counseling. Okay. It's the, he calls it the Greta transgender counseling segment and it's about 25 minutes long and it's one of the most beautifully crafted pieces of stand-up comedy i've ever seen in my life and it's storytelling but it's it's storytelling through acting he's playing he's he introduces all these different characters through the whole thing and i know you would love it because it takes the piss out of some sacred cows including greta thunder yeah i don't like sacred cows yeah Oh yeah, he 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 takes them down big time, and uh, again, I'm not going to try to recreate it because that's I what got just, my buddy Mike in trouble is taking down. That's Sacred right. Cows, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to try to recreate it because it's like the Joey Diaz thing. I would I would do it no justice. But if you go on YouTube, and and search Will Franken Greta Thunberg, and it'll come up. It'll there a few segments will come up. Go to the longer one, the 25 minute segment, and uh, it's absolutely brilliant. And Will Franken, at one point in his career, and I don't know if this was for real or if it was just something he did as as part of his quote unquote act, but he transitioned to a woman. Oh, and for a couple of years, he performed his stand up comedy as a woman. As I forget, I was like committed to the bit. Oh, big time! I forget what he renamed himself, and he did one bit about he was talking about when you when you go to that extreme. People will confide in you because they they feel that they have a shared experience that they couldn't tell anyone else. But when they see that you've gone to this extreme, they feel like they can confide in you. And he said that an elderly woman came up to him one time and said, you know, I had a lesbian experience once. It was back in the 1970s when lesbianism was quite new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, he says, uh, and she, she said, uh, of course, we didn't have strap-ons back then. We used vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> but he just delivers it beautifully. Besides and, his face. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He went through that phase. I don't know how long it lasted. And then he went back to being Will Franken again. He went from being Wilhelmina or whatever he called himself to being Will Franken. But he's, a, he's, he's, a absolutely, uh, he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you've, uh, I've noticed about you, you extend, you're, you have like a, this vast palette for comedy. You look at a lot of different comedians, um, you enjoy them. You went down to Vermont to 
just to catch Tim Dillon. I love Tim Dillon. I've yeah. seen some of his videos on yeah, YouTube, and hilarious. I thought if this guy ever comes anywhere near Montreal, I got to go see him. And it was, it was the year before the pandemic. He was headlining at uh, whatever the name of the comedy club is in Burlington. I think I it's Vermont think it's comedy. the Vermont Comedy yeah. Club. Yeah, yeah. And he was just terrific. Yeah, he's he's fucking great. Yeah, yeah. And he's great, and he's smart, and he's not afraid to uh, to take chances. That's how you have to be. Yeah, you you're not a you're not a comedian if you're not. You get it? You're something else. Yeah. You're play acting. If you're a comic, see what the fuck you want. Comedy used to be about taking down sacred cows. You need to be, you need to take down sacred cows and you, you need to have the skill to make it funny. Yeah. That's, that's what it Again, is. Again, it goes back to, uh, to the comedy unleashed thing in Britain. Funny is funny. And you would know this better than me, but I get the impression that, that ironically, the comedy community is overrun with wokesters. Like, there's a lot of woke in the comedy community. There, there is, but you know what you notice, which is amazing, and he and he picks up on this because he comes to shows a lot. They're not good at comedy. No. So they force themselves in the comedy scene, and then they'll tell you stuff backstage. You know, you shouldn't use that word. Yeah. You should. But, you know, what the difference is when I was on stage using that word, people laughed. You went on stage lecturing them. Nobody laughed. Yeah. Our job here is comedy. So you fucked up. You're not in a position to give me advice, to tell me what I should and should not do. You clearly don't understand the medium. You just thought you could come into a space where people are saying whatever they want and you could point and choose what you're going to get offended by and pick it apart. It's not a place for you. All these wokesters, the people that just go on and say, you can't say this word and what's the deal with white men, right? Like they're evil. They shouldn't even be at this club. You don't belong here. No. You don't. I saw a good quote from Norm MacDonald uh, shortly after he passed away, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was someone, someone quoted, they, they published a, uh, or they posted a picture of all the major late night talk show hosts, and they were all doing some sort of common climate change thing. And the quote from Norm MacDonald was, real comedians play for laughs, not for applause. Yes, exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. The and whole, because I, I can't, if I wanted to, I could go on stage, I guess, and say stuff like, uh, I don't know. You shouldn't rape people. Why are we murdering? No more yeah, murders. Yeah. Yay. Obvious things. Yeah. Obvious yeah. things. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Of course it's obvious. Why are we murdering people? Like, but that's not comedy. No. It's not my job. I don't know. I, yeah. I just don't understand why they I think they get into it some people just for that attention. They're like, I'm gonna say the right things and they're gonna like it. No, you gotta take risks. You gotta say some crazy shit that yeah. you think is funny and you hope that someone else as crazy as you. One of the things I came to really realize and, and appreciate about Norm McDonald in the wake of his passing and watching a lot of his stuff was he was so good that he could be endearing even when he was inappropriate. Yeah. He was you one of the greatest to ever no, do it. No matter how inappropriate he was, his presentation was so good that you still liked him. Yeah. Like he did a thing on his... Uh, he, he, what was the Norm Macdonald Live? Was that a podcast? Uh, he did... Uh, Norm was Macdonald that a streaming has a show? show? He has Norm Macdonald, that was on Netflix. It was like a talk show. Okay. He did his own streaming show that he was doing for a while uh, with Adam Egit, uh, which I, it was the same kind of show that they brought to Netflix. And he had his last special on Netflix too. Was the, the Hitler's um, Dog one? Yeah, I haven't seen that yet. Oh, I have great. to. I have to watch that. Uh, there, he had a show that was. Um, I think we might have had this conversation when we were talking with Terry on Zoom one day. He was talking about JetBlue being the most highly oh, yeah, ranked, yeah, yeah, yeah. highly ranked airline in customer satisfaction. <laughs> he's he's there with a couple of his buddies, two other comedians, I guess, and he says, and you know what the uh, with his, that delivery of his, you know what the least. Uh, uh, the the airline with the least uh, amount of customer satisfaction, nine eleven Air. Yeah, <laughs> he says, "What a terrible name for an airline." Reminds me of that tragedy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think you were saying it to Swartz or to David Spade. Yeah, one of the guy. It wasn't David Spade. It was a guy who I didn't recognize. But the, one of the guys who was sitting there, he looks at him and he goes, "Jesus." <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's uh, Swartz. I think that's the Jesus line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so just, but so beautifully delivered and just so he, he was just, he was Im impossible to dislike. He, he, I'm, sorry, I'm he telling you, impo he's a, yeah, impossible to dislike. Yeah, he was, he was one of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. One of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah, he was just so, so likable. And he kept it all to himself. Uh, no one, most people, I didn't even know His he was His illness, yeah, yeah, no, I didn't know either. Yeah, that's a sign of humility. That, that, that it, honestly, it was one of those, there was a lot of deaths this past month or so. That one shocked me. My, that, that shocked the fuck out of us. Yeah, I was shocked. I was saddened by um, when when Fez died from Ron and Fez, 
And uh, I was like, fuck, that's terrible. But I wasn't as surprised because he had heart problems. But Norm MacDonald, it, it felt like it was um, uh, someone messed up the story. It was, you know, somebody misunderstood and they ran with it. You know, sometimes they have fake deaths. Yeah. They're like, no, I'm not dead. Then Stallone has to come out and tell people I'm not dead. Mm. That's what it felt like. I couldn't believe that it was real. Yeah. Because it just came out of nowhere. Yeah. Did you know him? Uh, we you, never, I never got him? to meet him. No? I never got, and he was one of those, uh, you just assumed, you know, I was like, ah, I can't wait one day, you know, bring uh, yeah. Norm McDonald on the show, do something. He, you just felt like, oh, it's going to happen. And then you realize how uh, time is, it's, this is nothing. We're here yeah. so limited. That's it, yeah. yeah it's He's, such a limited what a, what a great legacy though, to imagine, you know, no one has said, no one has a bad word to say about him or ever did, I don't think. You know, I, I suppose he was, you know, some of his comedy could be pretty cutting. Yeah, but, but, but I, it's I, not I, evil. Yeah, it's not. And I, and, and he, I don't think he ever said anything cutting that wasn't also true there you or go. had an element of truth to it. Yeah. It was, uh, he, he was, he's, I, I'm telling you, one of the best to ever do it. Yeah. There's a Mount Rushmore of comedy. He's yeah. got to be on there. And underrated too, because Very I bet underrated. he doesn't come immediately to mind for most people. And, you, you know, who, greatest comedians of all time, George Carlin, Eddie Murphy, you yeah. know, how far Pryor. down the list of people, yeah, Richard Pryor, oh, you know, yeah. how far down the list of people go before they get to uh, Norm Macdonald, but he's, he's right up there. Cause the other guys had a lot of mainstream success as well. Yeah. Like even Chappelle, right? Chappelle is one of yeah. the greatest ever. Yeah. But he also has so much mainstream uh, appeal and impact that he comes to mind right away. Whereas you have guys for, let's say Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart is big on the mainstream, but he's nowhere near being one of the best comedians ever. Whereas Norm Macdonald doesn't have a percentage of what he, what Kevin Hart has on the mainstream, and he's definitely on Mount Rushmore. He's one of the best to ever do it. And what's the difference? Marketing? Uh, promotion? Marketing, promotion, who you like. Uh, style, if you're young, like, it's easier to market, let's say if right now I was a 20-year-old, you know, like a, a t you know, abs, teeny, like it's e teeny bopper type of style, mm. it's easier to market to the masses, but comedy fans find you when you have something um, to offer that's good as well, right? So let's say, if, but he was also reclusive a bit too, he would mind his own business. So let's say with uh, Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, there's a style to him. He's in movies. He's acting. Yeah. There's that fast way of speaking. He's he's fun. He's entertaining. He, you know, he's in movies of The Rock. Yeah, yeah. So even if you're not a stand-up comedy nerd or a fan, you're going to see him in the mainstream somewhere in these movies. You're going to like him. You're going to transition to his comedy. You have guys like uh, Tom Segura, who because he's so strong in comedy and he built such a big base and uh, people loved him, they followed him when he has movie roles. So you work the opposite. He's not going to be as big as a Kevin Hart, but fuck, he's big for, for comedians. Like he's, he's a mega star as far as comedians, are, uh, the way I see it at least. Uh, then you have Norm who, the movies he did in the beginning was, they were funny, but they weren't, it wasn't a time where it is now like with The Rock and all that where it was these billion dollar box offices and they're international. They were funny for funny sake, you know? And now it's about the megastar that's also in it. Is it going to sell to China? So you get yeah, all these eyes yeah. on you. It's a whole different. It's marketing. It's a, it's a whole different. Uh, also, volume. he's not he's not over the top. He he's was, not over the top. I was couldn't. Very, he was he was he was laid back. You had to be. You have to understand the language. He was smart. I can't see a Norm Macdonald style, even though he's one of the funniest to ever do it. I don't see what the appeal would be in China, for example, if someone doesn't have our sensibilities, doesn't get the jokes, the subtleties of Norm MacDonald. Whereas a Kevin Hart in the rock movie, it's explosions, it's jokes that are quick and you get it. Like, uh, uh, what do you mean I'm the tall guy, you know, and he's a small guy? Like, oh, I get it because yeah. he's small. Uh, it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same. You know who I interviewed one time who was really interesting, speaking of tall guys and small guys? Um, he's from California. But yeah. all this to say, by the way, not that Kevin Hart hasn't worked hard. I've heard his yeah, story yeah. too. Yeah. This guy, he's worked his fucking ass off. Yeah. Yeah. Who's the comedian from California who's a dwarf? Oh, Brad Williams? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I interviewed him one time during Just for Laughs when I was working at TSN 690, and they had a partnership with Just for Laughs, and they got me to interview some of the comedians. And I thought he was funny as hell. He is funny. And yeah. a really, really nice guy. And we were, we must have been about 10 minutes into the interview. I did the interview with Jay Farrar. And we were about 10 minutes in, and, and, and Brad Williams goes, you guys haven't even mentioned or asked me about being a dwarf. And we were like, well, it, that didn't really occur to me. We were having a good conversation here, talking about uh, talking about comedy. What did he say? Uh, well, he was he was actually quite appreciative. 
He was, uh, and that was gratifying to me. It, I didn't even think of it, and then I, but I did think to myself afterwards, and I sort of patted myself on the back for not immediately going directly to let's make short guy jokes and ask him about being uh, a dwarf. To me, that wasn't relevant. What was relevant was that he was a comedian and a really good one, and he was in Montreal to do just for laughs. He was on two drink minimum. Was he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 2018, 2019. I remember. I think 2018. And it was during Just for Laughs. And I asked him, because uh, he was bringing up uh, the midget thing. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I think, my best ever question in an interview. Because uh, I don't know, if Poseidon, if you remember that clip. I think it's online somewhere. It was fucking hilarious. It, essentially, he's being serious. And he's talking about how women feel safe around him. Because even if they get into a situation, sex or whatever, that they don't want to be in, he's small. They can leave. They make the decision. And then, I was, in straight face, I was just paused. I go, that's interesting. I go, but what if, you know, because th that, that's an internal safety. With you internally, they're safe. What about external safety? He's like, what do you mean? I go, what if there's a really big rapist and he rapes both of you? <laughs> 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 what did he and say? He started laughing. He's yeah. like, and Mike was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like, no one saw that angle coming. Yeah, I was like, yeah. interesting. However, <laughs> I have a retort. You know, and it was just so funny. Yeah, That's he's a good funny. guy. It was yeah, funny. He's a yeah. great guy. Big That's hockey fan. Land. Anaheim Ducks season ticket holder, if I recall. Really? Yeah, I didn't he, know that. Yeah, he likes his hockey. The, you know what? I've met a lot of Anaheim when I was in California. A lot of Duck fans. Yeah. I met a lot of Duck fans. I've met Kings fans too, but I, had, I remember I found it weird that there were Duck fans. Yeah. My son, Sam, Montreal born and raised for, uh, for a while when he was younger, he was an Anaheim Ducks fan. Because of the movie. No, he never watched the movie. He never watched Mighty no, Ducks? it was because of the internet. He just, you can go on the internet now and you can look up any hockey team and watch any team's highlights. And he he just, through exposure over the internet, he became an Anaheim Ducks fan. He has since, you know, he's older now. He's in his early 20s and now he's a Habs fan. He's a Habs fan living in Toronto. And uh -oh. I said, you watch, you're going to become a Leafs fan. No fucking way, Dad. I'll never become a Leafs fan. Uh, I don't change teams. Yeah. I'm a Devils fan. Well, listen, I was I lived in Toronto for five years in the early 80s, and I remained a Montreal Canadiens fan, but I also followed the Leafs, and I cheered for the Leafs because that was the, t the team in the town where I lived. So everyone was happy. Well, yeah, I guess, but I mean, it just to me, wherever you hang your hat is home, and I didn't deliberately say, okay, now I'm going to become a Leafs fan. I just became a Leafs fan because that was the team I watched and that was the team I heard about on a regular basis. Yeah, the Leafs can go fuck themselves. Yeah, as far yeah, as yeah. no, I agree with you 100%. Uh, but at that time, I was, you know, and they sucked. They never were going to, were gonna, they weren't going to win anything anyway. I also covered the team as well because I was a sports reporter at the time. So, that's, so you, I got you to start, know the players you, yeah, a little bit. I was at them. every game. So you develop an affinity for them, right? Enough exposure. I know that for Montreal, for example, I want the Habs to do well because I want everyone around me to be happy and they're mostly Habs fans, but I could give a fuck. I'm a Devils fan yeah. all the way. How'd you become a Devils fan? Because uh, I like Canadians, uh, so I had the choice. Do I like a team that has mostly Canadians on them okay. or should I like the Montreal team, which is 98 Russians? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not that. It's uh, I say that to piss people off. Uh, no, it's uh, 95 I started watching hockey. Okay, so, and, you, so you saw a couple of Devils Cup championships. Oh, I saw all three. There were three, eh? There were three cups. Okay. I got to witness them all, the, but the the first one was had impact on me. It was that shortened season, and I didn't know I didn't have a favorite team yet. And they had made it to the finals, and I think it was Detroit that they were facing. And everyone in the media was talking about how all oh, these Devils, this this Mickey Mouse team is in the finals. They're gonna get swept by the dominant, deserving dynasty, mm -hmm. the Red Wings. Yeah, because the Red Wings were. Yeah. They were winning every year back then. And the Devils swept them. Who was four. coaching? Was it Lemaire? Uh At the time, I don't remember. I was too young. I was 95. Okay. But I remember being shocked. Being like, what the fuck? This team that everyone said can't make it. And I liked the way they played. They were very defensive. I oh, loved and that's, how, that's I, when you became a fan? I fell in love with Scott Stevens. Okay. I modeled myself after Scott Stevens. That's how I would play defense. So cause I wasn't fast as Niedermeyer. Uh, and I just loved this team. And I love the logo. I love that they were the devils. I loved all that stuff about them. And Martin Brodeur, yep. from fucking, you know, he's from right Saint here. Leonard, yeah. So I was like, Jesus Christ, this is, this is the team for me. And uh, there were so many Canadian guys on there, you know, and they were tough guys. And I just fell in love with the team. And then I followed them. And, uh, you know, you can't, it's the team I like. You know, it's the organization I like. It's the logo I like. It's everything. I remember meeting Scott Stevens when he was a rookie. He was drafted by Washington. The Capitals were his mm -hmm. first team. Early 80s. And this was when I was covering the Leafs in Toronto. And they played the Capitals one night. And I went into the Capitals dressing room afterwards to do some interviews. And he was there. So I introduced myself and I held out my hand. He took my hand. His fucking fingers came halfway up my forearm. 
just and this is he was a 19 year old kid it was huge. massive somebody posted on uh, youtube the other day uh, a video of uh, an infamous body check that he delivered to patrick flatley of the islanders back in a playoff series in the 1980s and it's a wonder that flatley wasn't killed like it was like he had been struck by a car. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. He did that to Lindros once too. He killed Lindros. Yeah. He killed his career. Yeah. Uh, Paul Correa was yeah. never the same. Yeah. But yeah. Paul Correa also had that great moment in the playoffs that year. It was two thousand. I think it was two thousand three, uh, Stanley Cup Final Game Six, where he flattened Correa out. Correa was taken to the dressing room. Everybody was was nervous, but then Korea, uh, Paul Korea came back and scored the game winning goal in the same game mm-hmm. against the Devils, and they went to Game Seven. But then the Devils won, obviously three nothing in in Jersey. This was back when the it was a uh, Continental Airlines Arena. Okay, so it was the Meadowlands. It wasn't yeah. uh, Newark. With Newark, the Prudential Center is beautiful, mm-hmm. but it's a different feel. It's a different vibe than it was yeah. back back in the day. But I remember so. But he used to kill people. Yeah, if you had your head down. Yeah. And then after a while, him and, and uh, the team, they, especially with Niedermeyer, I think they had that strategy where they would allow a player to come down the side of the boards, and then as soon as they get to the blue line... Force him into the middle. Force him into the middle by blocking that, and Stevens would just yeah. railroad him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember that. I loved it. But I never got the feeling that it was any there, that there was any deliberate attempt to, uh, to injure. The hits were always... They were big and they were clean. The, you know what the issue was? He was playing within the rules. But he was bigger. Yeah, he was stronger, and it was a setup. They knew what they were doing. They they weren't. It wasn't like um, why the hits were so hard is because it wasn't a spontaneous thing. You're coming down the side. Like I know what I'm going to do to you. So he was so prepared. Niedermeyer would force him into the middle, and then yeah, and depending who he would play would with, finish him off. Yeah. Christ. Yeah, and it, it happened repeatedly. And the thing is, they were shoulder. Yeah. But you know, he'd go up a bit. He's a big guy yeah, too. Yeah, and yeah. when you have your head down, you're not looking. And you just, it was like hitting a wall. Yeah. And he would kill people. But it was within the rules. It was just people like, oh, it's a dirty check. It's a dirty, it wasn't that it was dirty. It was that it was, at the time, it was acceptable and it was super hard. It was a much harder sport back then than it is now. And at the time, I didn't even think about it. Now I'm like, fuck, I feel bad. (laughs) For Lindros, uh, Korea, all that. But at the time, you're just like, yeah, it's part of the game. Yeah. It's like football. Have a look at the Patrick Flatley hit. That's a little bit before your- he killed him? Yeah, a little bit before your time. But it was was maybe the most devastating hit that he's ever- And he's- Really? Yeah, yeah. It was, oh, man. Like I say, it's a wonder the guy wasn't killed. I remember- Literally like he'd been struck by a car. It was crazy, right? Yeah. And it wasn't- It wasn't elbows. It was none of that. It was just- Like you say, hitting a wall. Yeah. 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 Because you have your head down, so your face goes right into his shoulder- this guy, I remember his retirement um, when they honored him, and he was crying. I remember that, too. I was a big Stevens fan. I really liked him. And at the time, it was acceptable to like Stevens. Now, I guess they're going to be like, oh, my God, he's an animal. He was killing people. But, fuck, that's what hockey was. Yeah. He would, and he would stand up for everyone on the team. Yeah, people still people still like big hits. People still like fights. You know what I didn't like? I didn't like, like, the Ty Domi shit. You remember Ty Domi on yeah, Niedermeyer yeah. during the playoffs, that series? That I don't I don't remember anything specific, no. So it was towards the end of the game, the Devils were winning off completely. The, the puck is on the other side of the of the rink. Uh, Niedermeyer's, you know, when you're skating slow, yeah. trying to join the play. Yeah. Opposite side, uh, Ty Domi's coming and just fucking looks around, elbows him right in the yeah, fucking yeah, face. Well, that's, that's just dirty. Yeah, yeah that kind of shit I didn't yeah. like. Stevens was not a dirty hockey player. No, and Stevens then Stevens went word. crazy. Oh, I'm like, sure I'm he did. I'm going to fucking yeah. kill you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was great. I, yeah. Say, I remember, yeah, there was a lot of moments like that where Stevens would go to the other team's bench and go, you're going to see now. I'm going to fucking kill you out there. I'm going to fucking kill you. I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> I saw Ty Domi one time fight Steve Smith when Steve Steve Smith was a defenseman. For West, he was with Chicago at the time, and he got in a fight with Domi. Domi with the Leafs at the time? Maybe. Anyway, Domi hit Steve Smith so hard that Steve Smith's leg broke. Like you see his leg, Domi punches him in the head and you see his leg buckle. And he came out of that game with a fractured leg from a punch in the head. I don't know. I don't know. Ex- yes, I'm not shitting you. I don't know exactly Dude, it how was it works. crazy. You, if you Google or YouTube, uh, Ty Domi, Steve Smith, you'll see the fight, you'll see the punch, and you can see his leg buckle oh. when Domi connects with his head with the punch. Domi is tough and, as shit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and I read afterwards that he came out of that with a fractured leg for some reason. It was the impact of the hit to the head on his body fractured his leg somehow. I guess because his legs gave out, he was knocked out, and then I the weight. I guess so, yeah. I, yeah, I guess so. I don't know, but Jesus, Murphy, it was a... 
Steve Smith. The only dirty, well, d- known as a dirty player that I didn't mind, even though he did some dirty shit against the Devils, Sean Avery. Mm-hmm. I didn't because his tactics of like, you know, going in front of Brodeur and then yeah, they made the Avery yeah, rule and all yeah, that. Yeah. I, I'll tell you why it, I, it bothered me that like, fuck, we should have won that series. We lost it. But it wasn't, it wasn't like an attempt to injure. You see that I'm against. But to fuck around, to be a rebel, to he do that kind of shit, I don't mind. Disturber. He's a shit disturber. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I don't mind. And he fit well with Tortorella, I think. Yeah. I think I think uh, Marchand's like that. Brad Marchand. Yeah. He's a shit disturber. He's a shit disturber. Yeah. But if you're not being dangerous, yeah. I don't I don't like when people overreact. Oh, he told the guy to go fuck himself. Or he's, who, yeah. who cares? It's hockey. Yeah. I think Marchand sometimes will stray into dirty territory, though. I think he slew foots and stuff like that. Slew footing, I don't yeah. like. You could really injure someone. Yeah. Remember Chara? Remember when... Uh, I think it was on Pacioretty that hit. Who was it on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was Pacioretty. It was Pacioretty. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I think people in Montreal, we may have overreacted. I agree with you 100%. And I, I argued that and argued that and argued that. And people told me, oh, no fucking way. He did that on purpose. Yeah, I don't think so. I think he, I think he deliberately hit him. But I don't think at he, the speed that the game happens, I don't think that he's capable of lining him up and going, okay, here he comes. And I'm going to put him right into that stanchion. I'm going to tell you something, Rain. I've been playing hockey for years. I, and I have the presence of thought to think about what I'm going to do next. I've never in my life in that mo- thought of anything like related to boards. And I was a dirty fucking player. So I don't know why people think it was. It's very difficult to line that up. And it, it was just a hit. It was just a bad, bad place. It was just Montreal fans to me. It was Montreal fans overreacting to something yeah. that happened because it was the most hated player on the most hated team. Yeah. Chera and the Bruins. That's what it was. And, and I remember feeling weird about it because I was like, I want to jump on the bandwagon, but I can't. I, think I didn't want to jump think, on the bandwagon. I think you yeah. guys are fucking stupid. Yeah, seriously. Call the cops. What do you mean, call the cops? I was, they're like, we called the police. They're <laughs> waiting for him. What are you fucking stupid? What are you fucking, I'm not saying, Patrick Pat, Pat, didn't fake it. I'm not saying he faked no, the injury. No, not at all. It was a terrible thing. It was a thing. terrible thing. It was thing. very frightening. The accidents fucking yeah, happened. it was awful. It was awful, but if you, like, come on, guys. First yeah. of all, it's. Chara versus Pacioretty. He doesn't need to do that if he wants to really knock him the fuck out. He could just punch him in the goddamn yeah, face. Yeah. yeah. So it was, but it was weird how here they have. The, that's also why I don't like the Habs, because of Habs fans. Habs fans don't realize oh, yeah, how they, toxic yeah, they yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Habs, it never appealed to me because my exposure to them was their fans, the Montreal Canadian fans, and they're they're not all good fans. There's some good fans, but there's a lot of garbage fans. Yeah, a ton of garbage fans. Garbage fans. Yeah. They can, like, I admit, oh, my team lost or fucking, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that was a dirty play. Dude, a guy on the Habs can stab someone, <laughs> and they're gonna be like, "Yeah, but uh, I don't see a rule about knives." Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, come on, guys, don't be fucking stupid. Yeah. You, know? you can't get two minutes for stabbing. Well, yeah. there's spearing. <laughs> yeah, show me the rule book yeah, where yeah. you can't fucking stab people. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what are your what are your plans moving forward? Just the podcast. The podcast, well, I'm still working at uh, Light 106.7 out in Hudson. Uh, I have no plans of walking away from that because that's a lot of fun. It's uh, And it's also available on the internet, right? You guys are online. Yeah, we're online at light, light1067.ca, uh, and uh, it's 5.30 to 9 in the morning. It's three and a half hours. The toughest part is dragging my ass out of bed in the middle of the night. But once I'm there, it's a lot of fun. I still love doing the radio thing, and now I have the podcast thing to, uh, you know, to complement that, and it's great to be working with Terry again. I mean, it's so much it's just and I, I don't think you know you tell me i don't think we've skipped a beat i think that but i mean we've we've stayed in contact all these years we didn't work together for 13 years but we always spoke to each other at least once a week and uh and just you know the friendship is the friendship never waned and uh we're just having a lot of fun doing the podcast and and the feedback has been good as well yeah I mean, they're having fun watching yeah, you guys it, the podcast. yeah it's, it's it seems like and you know, the challenge will be, we have a lot of people who used to listen to us when we were on the radio. Hey, it's great to hear you guys together again. The challenge is, can we bring a new crowd yeah. into That's the tent happening. and a younger crowd into the tent? Well, my son, Sam, who's 22, tells me that, you know, some of his friends have texted him and said, hey, I like your dad's podcast. There you go. So that's a good sign. And we're, uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. We're, we're grateful and beholden to you and Mike and Poseidon for uh, providing us with the facilities and the expertise to get it off the ground. Well, you're more than welcome to be here. Ted Bird standing by with him and Terry right here on this goddamn channel. Links are in the description. Thank you, Ted. Thanks, man. Thanks, Poseidon.